But if I make 300000 but I went and bought Lamborghinis and a boat and a house and, oh, yeah. you know, eat out every meal and I'm spending 290000 a year between taxes and everything else, I made ten grand. Who's, yeah. You may have more fun, but as far as reserves and sustainability, that's that's not a sustainable pace, guys. You see this in personal life all the time, right? People that live right there at their means. This is This is what they make or this is what they bring in and this is where they live. And all it takes is something like COVID, something like some kind of disaster, some kind of uh, talk about hurricanes not hitting for three years. And then all of a sudden your means stays the same, right? But your but your pay or something gets cut. Yep, exactly. And then you're in a hole, you dig yourself a hole that you're constantly always trying to get out of. I'm here with Kobe Hearn, and Kobe is a master's in being an adjuster. Is that right? <laughs> That's the uh, title I guess I've been uh, dubbed thanks to Chris over at IA Path, uh, the master's in the business of adjusting. So Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I knew it was something like that. I was like, it's an MBA something. Matt, and I was, I was driving to, over here, and I was like, it's got to be master's of being an adjuster. Master's of business being a master's. What was it? Masters of Masters of adjusting. Yeah. Masters of the business of adjusting. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about um, kind of what you've been up to. I know that that uh, you were a student of Adjuster TVs last year, and but you've got a kind of a really deep um, background in sales. Right. And you've got, uh, you know, a lot of um, uh business acumen i think that you can bring to adjusters and kind of to help them you know you know i think we, and we'll talk about this certainly but one of the things that i feel like adjusters kind of fail at is that we, we forget that this is kind of like this is you really have to be like your own business it's a small business that you're running as an independent adjuster because you're you, know, you, you don't get paid just to show up you don't get paid by the hour you don't get a salary <laughs> you don't get hired and then you just start getting a check and they just you just do whatever that they tell you you are you have to go get the work and then when you get the work you have to be good at the work and be productive and that's the only way that you get paid so let's talk a little bit about kind of your background um, and kind of what you bring to this conversation Sure, of course. Um, my to start, just so you know, I'm obviously you can tell by my accent. Uh, I'm from the South, Southern, um, from Kentucky. I've got um, my uh, degree, obviously, double major in sport management and human performance, with a minor in Spanish, and then I went on to get my MBA in sport management. It's a dual degree. Uh, that's kind of where the MBA thing came in, thanks to Chris Stanley and kind of dubbing that. Um, but I have an extensive back ground in business. I started out working for the St. Louis Cardinals, Miami Marlins and operations. Um, that was really my first real job um, besides being a farm boy. Um, and then, you know, kind of progressed from there. And I got into um, working for NASCAR NHRA in the nonprofit sector um, to support people with paralysis and prevent spinal cord injuries, which moved into the, you know, into sales because I wanted to work smarter, not harder, right? I was working 100 hours a week, seven days a week, no days off um, for four or five months in, in South Florida. Not, not something I recommend for anybody, but uh, I progressed into a sales gig outside of sports, um, did uh, sales of regional sales manager of an LED lighting startup, um, which I found a lot of success with. Um, and then I went on into, you know, working in the sports with the Atlanta Braves. Um, which I loved, but decided to transition into working for large venues. So if you ever go to a Carrie Underwood concert, you'll see some posters uh, behind me there. I think I need to use this hand. There we go. Um, you'll see that I worked at venues and I was a corporate partnerships manager. So what I did was make relationships. You know, you see those outfield wall signs. Um, you see all the advertisements when you go to games or big concerts. That's what I sold. That's what I did. I worked for big, I worked with big businesses. Um, and ended up doing that up until about COVID. Um, and funny enough, I ran into a veteran adjuster that had been doing this for 10 or 15 years, thanks to my better half. She knew her as a good, close, personal friend. 
And she just piqued my interest saying she worked four months a year, traveled the rest of the year, made large six figures, and it just piqued my interest. And she was like, yeah, I'm a property adjuster, right? So um, that brings us basically up to date. And I found Chris Stanley at IA Path, um, which gave me kind of the tools to get training. And at that time I I took his auto mentorship course. Um, and then I had, you know, Matt Allen himself, the great guru of property, um, in the fall. And I was doing both for a while. I was running, I was doing my full-time job with COVID working from home, um, and then running auto daily claims in the Northern Colorado, Wyoming area. And, you know, I, it was so funny because think, you think about direction and path, right? Um, and I was dead set. I'm going to be a property adjuster. I'm going to make, you know, tons of money. I'm going to travel the country. Me and my, you know, better half are going to be a, a team and we're going to adjust and do all this stuff. And I just fell in love with auto damage appraisal. Um, I found a knack for it. I found kind of a niche niche market there um, where I was at and made some really great relationships with firms. And as of, what was it, April 1st, I believe, officially? Uh, yeah. Bought a house in St. Cloud, Minnesota, uh, first house, uh, and moved here and took a franchise with SCA appraisals um, to cover the entire state of Minnesota and part of Wisconsin. I now have four appraisers under me, as well as my better half has her own business now in this industry, um, doing a lot of desk writing and handling two or three other firms um, that I really liked working for, that we have a really great relationship. Um, So she's even making a full-time living doing this, and we both transitioned out of our full-time jobs that we felt we were working way too many hours for the pay scale and the reward because if you know events and entertainment you know you're working 80 100 hours nights and weekends and you you're salaried so um right and as many of you can relate so that's kind of my background i've been around um very influential very amazing business people um, something I will even start out with as far as a saying, which you may hear a lot in this um, episode. Um, but I've always believed strongly in when you go, you know, if you're the smartest person in a room, find another room. OK, <laughs> I'm not I'm not saying don't be friends with those people or whatnot, but I, I've always strived to be in the room where I'm surrounded by smarter people than myself. And when it comes to business, I have been very fortunate and blessed to always find myself in those circles, whether it's in auto damage or property or, you know, um, events and entertainment or just regular everyday business. You ever feel like you've been thrown to the wolves by the IA firms you work for, like you're just a number on a roster? Wouldn't it be nice to work with a firm who's big enough to get plenty of work, but still small enough to know you by your first name? Then let me tell you about my friends at the Oklahoma-based IA firm, Paysetter Claim Service. Founded in 1997, the thing that sets Paysetter apart is their relentless pursuit of excellence. They hold themselves and their team of adjusters to a higher standard of quality. And now with their advanced all-in-one claims platform called Evo, You'll get a real-time Uber-style map and communication link to the insured, automatic messages sent to customers throughout the process, file review automation, and a fast, accurate scope with Paysetter's partnership with Hover. Hover is integrated directly into Evo, making for a smooth and seamless field scoping experience for you as the adjuster. Technology is moving faster than ever, and Paysetter is right there at the cutting edge. AdjusterTV.com slash Paysetter. Very cool. Very cool. So yeah. And, and speaking of business, let's kind of talk about, um, s- sort of the difference between like just having a career or a job where you just show up or you get a salary or you get, you know, you get paid by the hour or whatever. And being a, basically a business owner. So can you speak to me a little bit about that. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, business owner, I, I found that a lot of people that go out for the first time, like they, everybody thinks, oh my God, I want to be a business owner. I want to have that freedom, right? But the mindset, think about it. Since you have started working, it's really ingrained in you that you need to work nine to five. I call it the nine to fiver mentality of you, you go there, work your eight hours and get a paycheck and come home. 
you don't worry about accounting. You don't, you don't worry about finance. Maybe if you're like, for me, I was a sales guy, right? I didn't handle the accounting. I didn't handle the marketing. I didn't handle, um, the back men, back in admin. I didn't handle the operational part of it. Um, so you just are in this nine to five mindset that I work my eight hours and I go home. Right. And business ownership means, especially small business owners, like, auto damage appraisers and property adjusters. We're a small business owner. We are a company of one, most likely. Um, luckily, I've got my better half helping out. But point being, you're on your own and you have to handle your accounting, your sales, your marketing, um, your operations, your processes, your flows, um, profits versus expenses. You've got to become a master of everything, um, at least in the interim, um, you know, and that's where I'd get into talking about um, outsourcing and things of that nature of, of finding what you do well versus, you know, outsourcing what you don't do well. But you but you have to have a knowledge of all of these areas all of a sudden, right? You may be, my, my best comparison, you may be the world's top chef. You may be Gordon Ramsay, right? Look at how successful he is. But he puts being a business owner before being a chef. He has learned business. He is a businessman through and through. You can be the best chef in the world, open your own restaurant, and fail within the first year. Why? Because you don't know how to run front of house. You don't know how to do accounting. You don't know how to do all these other things. And there's only so much you can outsource before it becomes inefficient or not cost effective. And I I would even go so far as I've deemed it – Kobe Hearn here, right? I'm a big Kobe Bryant fan, of course. Um, but the Mamba mentality that you're always you're you're always working to be better. You're never satisfied. That nine to five guy gets his work on his plate. He's told what he has to get done, and then once he's done, he goes home. His phone's probably not ringing. You know, he's not having to worry about stuff at nine, ten, eleven o'clock at night. Whereas for adjusters and appraisers that are independent, you may have to work a 16 hour day. It's pretty common in our industry when hail, hail storms happen, hurricanes. Um, so you've got to have that Mamba mentality that when no one else is watching, what are you doing? Are you still building your business? Are you onboarding firms? Are you paranoid? You know, um, that, that maybe one of your firms that you've been working for, let's take, uh, you know, a, a big four like pilot or Eberls. That's the only person you've ever worked for. Are you paranoid to think that they may lose business, that they may go out of business? Cause as a business owner, I am, I'm always paranoid that I don't have enough work or I don't, I'm not insulated enough. And it's just that, that switch in your mind that everything falls on your shoulders now. And you don't have to panic, but you have to realize that you don't have other people to lean on when you don't know something. Um, and it goes to another saying I have is what you don't know can and will kill you 100% of the time in business. That's a fact. So, 100%. So that's kind of, you know, uh, that that's the first thing I start with all new appraisers and, and adjusters getting into this industry is switch that mindset. Understand that, you know, there's going to be things you don't know, but you can't just say, ah, I'll figure it out later. That's great example is accounting, right? If you don't understand how to set your business up or how your taxes are going to look at the end of the year, you end up with a $20,000 tax debt. You could be done before you ever get going, and you didn't even know it. Um, you know, understanding how to do your profits, how to do your expenses, how to set up processes, um, and to really never, it really goes to the core of never being satisfied. And some nine to fivers, I'm not knocking nine to five jobs. I really am not. What I'm saying is, is that there's some level of comfort knowing that there's a higher corporate power or that business is making sure the wheel keeps turning, whether you take vacations, whether you get sick, um, whether you know everything or not about that company. Um, you're just a cog in their wheel. Whereas in a business, you are the entire wheel. That's all it is. Right. <laughs> exactly. So, 
Yeah, and so like to, just to kind of talk to, about that just a little bit, um, I had this conversation with my mom, like for years, because she I was and I was a successful independent adjuster making you know good really good money, um, six figures most years. Matthew, you need to go and get a job at, you know, where, where they give you a salary and benefits. And da, 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 da. I'm like, listen, I build my own benefits package, right? I get to pick what health insurance I, I have. I get to pick what car insurance. I get to pick what car I drive. Pick the laptop. You know, when the stuff breaks, yeah, I got to pay for it. I got to replace it. I have to maintain it. Um, but the other thing is, is that, and I learned this in my brief uh, year-long stint as a staff adjuster at a major carrier and that is is that they will do a reorganization they do them all the time right so they, they get a new ceo or they get some new like you know, executive level people and they'll say all right so i'm looking at this map of the united states and we have all these people these resources and people in all these places i think it would make more sense if we did it another way where we put the, this resource over there and move this over here and close these 14 off it's like state farm just did this close all these 14 offices and then we're only going to have one office or we're going to have three offices one reach you know east coast midwest and west coast right whatever it is right all those people that work in those places there's a good chance that they're going to get a call or a letter or in a, during a meeting with their team manager they're going to say hey listen you know just this just came down from uh from on high um we're doing a, a reorg and everybody that's in this territory um is going to get the option of either taking a severance and have, you know, nice to know you or moving to Fargo, North Dakota or moving to, you know, Temecula, California or moving to Tampa or moving to wherever. Right. And you're in Atlanta or you're in Kansas city, like your family's there and you've been there for seven years with this company. Those are your choices. Right. So it's not, yes, those are it, And I, I, and again, I'm totally with you. I'll never disparage any nine to five job at all because it's, you know, this, this kind of work isn't for everybody. And I think part of what we do on Adjuster TV and what you, you, know, you do with your podcast is we're, we're trying to help people decide if this is right for them, right? Because you do have to be the most su successful adjusters. You got to have all the things nailed, right? Or at least have the capacity to learn them and to, and to get them nailed. And it's when, you, when you've got your marketing down, you know, which is how you interact with your with your carrier and with your your IA firm, and if you're diversifying out to other IA firms, um, sales, right? Same thing. Your production, your your skills as an adjuster, learning policy, learning, getting better in exact to me, all that stuff. You have to look at it as <laughs> as a business. And if the most success, like I said, the most successful adjusters um, are the ones who crush all of those things, or at least who are see them all money management accounting all that stuff and, and they have a, you know one of the biggest challenges i always faced was uh you make you know you work from march or april to halloween basically as a as a catastrophe adjuster and then the rest of the time you can go you can work and do whatever you want you know the rest of the year but you get you're getting like a big paychecks you know all through the middle of the year and then it drops off on the ends well your home expenses You've got storm, you know, travel expenses or whatever, but you're like your mortgage and your car payment and all that stuff, they stay the same, right? So how do you, you know, I, it was kind of a little bit of a puzzle for me and I finally figured it out, but it was how do I save money for, to cover myself until the next storm season starts, including paying for expenses and everything, save money, and then what, what if this can I blow? Can I blow any of it? Am I gonna have to like really, should I work over the winter? Um, and have a spreadsheet for that where you, you know, you, put, you just punch the numbers in and it, it all kind of, it tells you, you know, or, and then you can, I don't know. I, it's money management is something I think that a lot of adjusters fail on um, and not because they're failures or ignorant or whatever. It's just that they're, they just don't know, right? It, you're not, you're used to, most people are used to that nine to five thing and they're not used to, you know, <laughs> the middle of October having the firm say, okay, well, that's all the claims we got. We'll call you on the next one. And then you don't hear from them until March. Well, that's what do you do? That's great points, Matt. Like literally so many layers there. But, the, but the first thing I'll, I'll touch on is just the 
um, the part about we're just trying to make sure it's right for you because there's no harm, no foul if it's not. But if you get into this industry running a business, I mean, you're taking on a lot, right? You, you talked about money management. Um, you know, if you've got a family, if you've got kids, you know, do you really want to travel that much? That, that may be what is available to you. You know, do your homework. Um, you know, I, I've got people that ask me, you know, they're sitting right there in Texas, right? And it seems like it, it, instead of people like, you know, popping up that want to get taught, you know, or, or learn this craft or get into it in North Dakota, where, you know, you could rake in all the claims all the time. Okay. It's always people in Texas or Florida. And it's like, you know, I don't want to shoot you down or kill your dreams, but daily claims may not really be an option for you unless you're willing to really, you know, build that business or, or work with those firms um, long enough for them to trust you over the veterans that are sitting down there that have 10, 15 years of experience, right? As your neighbor, um, you may have to take cat claims, but more so than that, are you willing to wait out or weather the storm, quote unquote, of, of financial instability, of getting started? Um, do you have enough cash reserve? Um, you know, something I, I preach is you need to have at least six months, at least six months of reserve capital to cover all of your expenses. Meaning if you didn't make a single dollar when you quit your you know, full-time job or part-time, whatever you're doing, if you don't have at least six months to pay your mortgage, your car, everything, food, gas, groceries for six months, do not get in this industry. I, I've seen it. it yeah. I mean, you've seen it, Matt, where it just can dry up and you have nothing. And this is and beyond you, buying gear, getting training, you know, going to certifications, getting your licenses and all that stuff. You gotta have, that's all already paid for. Now you've gotta have that like that you know that bank of six at least six months minimum yeah at least i mean to me i think comfortably a year but i'm saying like if you're just so sick and you're ready and maybe a hurricane made landfall right and you're getting a call finally I, i'm not going to tell you that that's not the right decision for you i'm just saying make sure you have six months because even with the hurricane making landfall even if a firm's calling you and saying Hey Matt, uh, I've got a hundred, you know, heavy equipment claims. It's paying five hundred dollars a pop. Great, but it will. It, it's not going. That's not sustainable. Right. And that's one of my other big points. You know, that, that you touched on is sustainability, right? Look, yeah. you can go out there and bring down big six figures, two hundred and fifty, three hundred thousand dollars a year. But if you're not saving and managing your money and really understanding profit and expenses, um, you may be running at a loss. You, you may be end up, you know, mortgage foreclosure and all kinds of stuff. I, sure. I mean, you it's think it's crazy. You, you, you think it's crazy. Yeah. But, 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 you know, my dad always told me it was a really great thing that stuck with me since I was little. He said, son, it's not how much you make, but it's how much you spend. Right. So, if I only make 30 grand a year, but I only spend five grand, right? I come out with 25, just for easy math. But if I make 300,000, but I went and bought Lamborghinis and a boat and a house and, oh, yeah. you know, eat out every meal and I'm spending 290,000 a year between taxes and everything else, I made 10 grand. Who's, yeah. You may have more fun, but as far as reserves and sustainability, that's that's not a sustainable pace, guys. You see this in personal life all the time, right? People that live right there at their means. This is this is what they make, or this is what they bring in, and this is where they live. And all it takes is something like COVID, something like some kind of disaster, some kind of uh, talk about hurricanes not hitting for three years. And then all of a sudden, your means stays the same right but your but your pay or something gets cut yep exactly and then you're in a hole you dig yourself a hole that you're constantly always trying to get out of so that that i think you hit on a lot of topics there and layers of business when you start this you need to make sure, sure you have reserve uh if you're not good at money management 
believe me, there are at every networking event in the world, there are like 15 accountants and 15 financial advisors. And they can really help you at least somewhat understand what you're getting into, right? Yeah. And, and they'll be happy to do it. Yep. And I think uh, adjusters have, kind of have to look at the long game. Like, so, you know, for me, well, f- just to kind of back up, I, what I've heard, and I don't know if this is true on the IA side or not, but on the, the, the staff side, they're like, you know, they, they have cat teams, you know, at big, big insurance companies. And they'll say, you know, if you get hired on or if you, if you go into a cat property role where all you do is just chase storms, um, you've, you're going to last about two years doing that. That's what they say. Because it's stressful, right? And it's, it's a lot of travel and everything, especially if you've got a family and little kids and stuff. Um, I managed to last 20 years, but I think that's just because I'm a glutton for punishment in some way. <laughs> but, you know, and then transitioning over to, to daily, um, you're right. So when you, when you talk about kind of the long game, we kind of have to like address goals, right? So like what is, a, what's, what's an adjuster, what should they be kind of thinking about with, in, with regards to short-term, mid-term and long-term goals it, as a claims professional from, from your kind of standpoint? <laughs> um, it's so, gl- I'm so glad you asked that because goals, I, I spoke on this and I actually did a podcast entitled why a hundred thousand dollars a year is a horrible goal. Um, <laughs> and I, I mean this and I, I don't mean that it's a horrible goal in the sense that you shouldn't strive to try to make more money guys and girls out there. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that for, for new appraisers and adjusters and even veteran appraisers and adjusters, you have to understand how to set goals. And I feel like it's not really talked about or taught. Um, I had to figure this out late in life, honestly, um, because, you know, we all do it. New Year's Eve rolls around, right? We set some New Year's Eve resolutions. It's like, I want to lose 50 pounds. Well, <laughs> right. That's great. But that's not a good goal. Here's why. To lose 50 pounds, that is a desired outcome. That is a that is something that that's an end result that you want to achieve. But you have not set any process goals or performance goals to get there. So to so understand that, right? That process goals are like um, you want to lose 50 pounds is your desired outcome, right? Process goals means I, I want to get a gym membership, right? You, you have to have uh, basically milestones and a path, like laying brick, so brick other, paver. It's, it's the difference between, so uh, b- losing 50 pounds and looking great naked and being fit and everything, that's a side effect, right, of what should be the goal, which is this year or going forward from here on out, my goal is to be, to live a healthier lifestyle. The other things are kind of a side effect to that, right? Yeah, and and, and you've got to, boil it down, right? Where do you start? Gym membership. I'm going to walk three times a week, right? I'm going to, these are, these are process goals. I'm going to, you know, this, I, I'm not going to eat, um, certain foods, right? Or, or, or I'm going to get on Atkins or whatever it may be, right? Those are processes. But then you look at performance goals, which are more like milestones or hitting achievements, right? Those are less controllable. Process goals are the most controllable goal you can set. Performance gets a little bit less because, again, there's external factors that can influence those. Sure. You know, um, process goals. Holidays. Yeah, but process goals, you're the only one choosing it, right? You're the, you're the only one that can affect it. Going to the gym three times a week, you're the only one that can make yourself or not make yourself. But performance goals are like, I want to be able to run a 5K in X amount of time, or I just want to be able to complete a 5k, or I want to run a half marathon, or, you know, I want to be able to bench press X amount of weight. Those are performance goals, right? And then if you hit all of those goals at the end of, at the end of that year, I can guarantee you this. I can't say that you'll be 50 pounds lighter and look great naked. But what I can say, you will be a heck of a lot closer to your end result, your desired outcome, than you would have been if you had just said, I want to lose 50 pounds and look great naked. And did nothing. 
and and you didn't set any you know checkpoints you didn't set any things that you needed to hit it's baby steps right yeah. it's it's like any time like you know if i said matt i want you to be able to throw a hundred mile an hour fastball <laughs> okay <laughs> yeah you're like yeah all right but there's people like Usain Bolt, I, I see this going around on social media right now, that he said he trains, he trained four years to run nine seconds. Fastest man in the world, right? Yeah. But And he says people will give up after two months not seeing results. Why? I guarantee you every top athlete, every CEO of Fortune 500 companies set process and performance goals that they are hitting baby steps. If you can just keep moving forward, you will yeah. get there. May not so, be in the time frame you wanted to, but you'll get there. Exactly. So, so f- as far as like a, a claims career, like what are some p- performance and process goals? You know, facing a lawsuit can be a terrifying and stressful experience, jeopardizing your years of hard work and success. If you don't have adequate insurance coverage as an adjuster, you're putting yourself at great financial risk. If you make your living from handling claims as an independent adjuster, then you must get errors and emissions and general liability insurance coverage. It doesn't matter if you're a 1099 or a W-2 or you work carrier direct, protect yourself with professional liability insurance from Kaplik. To find out more and to download the insurance for adjusters free guide, head on over to cplic.net slash adjuster TV. That's cplic.net slash adjust your TV? Well, that's a great question. It depends on you, right? It depends on what your goal, your desired outcomes are, right? You can set those and work backwards from there. So to give you an example, if you wanted to hit six figures or more a year, well, what do you have to do to hit six figures in this industry? Well, let's see. I need um, I, I need to be on with X amount of firms, right? That's a good goal. Like I need to diversify and have X amount of firms. I need to be able to handle these specific types of claims, whether that's heavy equipment, light auto, property, commercial, residential, liability, desk. I mean, as you know, Matt, there's a million different types of claims that you can handle and specialize in. Marine, uh, airplanes, you know. So find those things that are in your area that are in demand, right? Talking to firms and set those goals based on what firms need, what the demand is, or it it could be, you know, I need to work, uh, for, I need to take four deployments this year or two deployments this year to get to that desired outcome. Um, I need, and then as far as performance goals, you know, you set like, I need to do 30 claims a week or whatever, because you can break it down. You can back up the math, but maybe 30 claims a week. Um, I need to be, uh, I don't know, I need to cut 15 minutes off of my estimating per claim because time is money, right? For the sure. quicker you can close claims, the more money you can make. So then you look at performance goals of I want to cut down my estimates by 15 minutes. I need to cut down my scoping maybe by a half hour. Um, I need to route my claims more efficiently. Um, I, I, you know, I need to maybe, maybe even, you know, part of it is um, proving your experience to up your fee bill to maybe get a better percentage, maybe a better, you know, per claim rate. Um, but those are the types of goals, processes, and and, and performance goals um, to see. You know, oh, here's a great one because you talk about it all the time about how many claims you can close in a day, right? Set a goal for how many claims during a catastrophic event that you want to close. Yeah, eight claims, ten claims, and you know I, I hear you and a lot of the veterans talk about it. The more claims you close, the more money you make, right? Um, yep. Yep. And I, I would even say on the back end, since we talked about sustainability, set goals of how much money you want to save. You know, like I want to put back five grand a month in savings. I want to, you know, um, start a, uh, you know, IRA, a Roth IRA. I want to, you know, get a financial advisor, what, whatever. I need to get an accountant. I need to outsource to an accountant to handle so I can be more efficient with what I do well. Right. I don't need to be worrying about my bookkeeping and trying to write eight claims a day. I need to have a bookkeeper. So 
that's what I would say goals would look like. And that's, and when I learned that it's amazing how your mentality shifts and how you can really measure so many metrics to, to realize, Oh my God, I'm crushing it. I'm so, I can't believe I hit all these little things and I look up and I'm like, Oh my God, I am averaging $5,000 a week, you know, like, yeah, yeah, right. and you and you start thinking back how you got there. And it's like, well, it's because now I'm running 40 claims a week and I'm doing heavy equipment and classic cars. And so that's the amazing part is if you focus, if you take a microscope and focus in, once you come back to the big picture, it's like, oh my, wow, look at where I'm at. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, and I think uh, that's, that's, I hadn't quite thought about it that way, but I think having the performance and process goals to say, I mean, you have to do it, right? <laughs> but actually like having that like front of your mind, like this is exactly what I'm doing. So I'm saying, all right, in order to make $100,000 take home, what would it say, right? I need to make at least like 120 something, maybe 130-ish, right? Something like that. Um, how many claims... So you just start backing it up, right? So you take you take your goal and you just start backing it up. So how many claims do I need to do to close, let's say on the property side, just to kind of like give a property example, in order to get that much money? Well, I'm averaging, I looked back at the last two years and I'm averaging, you know, $314 net per claim, right? And then, so, you know, it's do the math, divide that up, say, okay, well, I need to, to close. We'll just, I'm not going to do the math. We'll just say, I need to close 800 <laughs> claims, right? So now you're going to say, okay, well, in order to close 800 claims, currently I can do, like my fastest I can do is six a day, right? You know, closed claims, whether I'm writing them up on site and closing them on site, or if I'm scoping during the day and then writing them at night, six claims a day, it's, it's kind of, you're in my well, just as an example is my average. So now you're now you're starting to see you're starting to say okay, well is is 130 attainable or not, right? Am I, with my current capacity, what do I have to do? Like where, you know, I I'll have to actually because I'm only working for these months and I'm working an average of you know 5.5 days a week because of rain days and you know whatever um, during storm season. We'll just go for the cat side. Um, there's no way I'm going to hit 800 claims with my current production, my current ability, my current clients. Don't give me that many enough claims or just don't have enough. So then you start to see, all right, well, I got to pick up another uh, firm or pick up, you know, another carrier or something like that. I have to, to get some advanced Xactimate training because that's I'm, I'm seeing that it's taking me a long time to, to work through. Xactimate scoping, maybe it'll help me to get to that 130 to spend a little bit of extra money on Hover or Eagle View or something like that. Um, so that's, that's, uh, or, that's or a- Or even, Matt, with that, even diving into a different segment, like you, you talk about yeah. people do residential and dive into commercial. Like all of a sudden, that fee bill goes way up in commercial. So, yeah, exactly. you know, you can make money quicker, but that, that's exactly right. You back it up. Now, I, I do want to make just two quick points, so I, I said it. One, I don't mean for you to set 400 different goals, okay, or 400 processes and performance. Again, baby steps. Maybe start with three to five. Hit those and then reevaluate. Okay, don't don't just uh, you know t- try to do everything at once. You'll fail 100 percent of the time. Um, I've heard you. I think say it. I believed in it for a long time. Single task, right? Focus on one single task. Same way with goals. Focus on one single goal at a time. Unless they run exactly parallel. Okay, if they're if they're aligned, um, it, it's very important that you can maybe do both, right? Maybe two goals, three goals, but they have to align exactly and succinctly with what you're doing to get those byproducts or desired results. Secondly, write them down and share them with your family, your friends, um, your peers. The reason I say that is, hey, it holds you accountable writing them down, and, and it holds you accountable telling other people, right? Like if you say, I'm going to lose 50 pounds, right? But for Matt or for me, if we don't tell our significant others, they you know, may not hold us accountable. But the biggest part of that 
is making sure that the people closest to you are aligned with your goals and support you, right? Matt can, Matt can say, I want to lose 50 pounds, but if his wife decides to bake cakes and cupcakes and sweets every day, right. that's not lining up with his goals. Exactly. So again, those may be some hard conversations, right? Like you've got to deploy a ton to make these, to, to make that, um, you know, 100K goal or more or whatever, but you got to have support behind you. I've always found that in life, no matter what you're doing. Um, but with goals, make sure that you're having those those hard discussions and making sure that not only you, but your quote unquote team is on board with what you're trying to accomplish and trying to help you get there. Um, there's nothing worse than having people that drag you down, don't believe you can do it. I mean, we've all been there. Yeah. Um, and you got to know when to cut that dead weight. Now, I'm not saying cut the dead weight of your wife because she's a baker, okay? I'm just saying <laughs> have that conversation like, sweetheart, how about you don't bring home so many cookies and like, you know, th that kind of thing. That's, that's what I'm getting at. So I just want to make those two points about goals to wrap up just so I said it. Yeah, absolutely. So and it, it makes perfect sense. I mean, you, you want to have support from the people that you care about and that you love and that are kind of on your team, especially your core team at home. And, you know, kind of to go back to, to the to the goal again, is, is the goal realistic? I mean, maybe you're not going to hit 130 this year. Maybe you with all the things that you've identified that you have to do that you work on one at a time, laser focused, single tasking. Maybe it's going to take you two and a half years to do it. Right. So. Be realistic about how long it's going to take. Understand that anything in this 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 business is, or any business with any job with any anything is going to be a process and a journey. And you know, I don't know when, when you when you start to see. I, I always call it like seeing the matrix a little bit. When you kind of start to get see the shape of the thing, then you can start to figure out how to get your arms around it, pick it up, you know, and take carry it off <laughs> with you. Um, so, and speaking of which. How, how would something like, you know, if we're talking about a, um, a person who's going to be a, a successful as a business owner, which is what, we're, what we are as, as adjusters, as independent adjusters, you know, the, the sales piece of it, how is an adjuster, you know, what does that look like for an adjuster and how can they kind of like maximize sales or under, their understanding of sales to kind of like leverage that into building their career? First things first with sales, um, and I say this uh, with a take this as a grain of salt, but everybody is in sales. Everybody. You're always selling yourself, whether you're single and trying to get a date, <laughs> um, whether you are, uh, you know, trying to get a job and putting a resume and going in for an interview, whether you are trying for that promotion. Um, whether you are trying to, you know, talk your wife into letting you going fishing with the boys for the weekend, <laughs> you're in sales, whether you believe it or not. Um, everybody is selling themselves all the time. I, I, I love the saying, and it's not mine, uh, 110%, not mine. I'm not claiming it, but, um, know your ABC always be closing. Okay. So what that means is in you've got just like setting goals there's things you want to attain right you want more firms you yeah. want um, more business isn't that what every business you know is out there you want more so you're never satisfied as a business owner any ceo is paranoid as all get out that new competition is coming into the area whatnot and they and every business puts a high emphasis on sales why that's how you generate money that's how you keep that wheel round and round okay um and everybody can do it it's not you don't have to be like me that can talk for 15 hours straight with no breaks um or that can you know or you know you can charm the pants off anybody in a room uh as long as they don't see my face uh you I'm know pants right now just because I started. <laughs> there you go see so um it, 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 but, but point being is you don't have to be, um, a, you know, a Rico Suave of sorts. You, you need to think about it this way, learn how to communicate effectively, right? You, you need to be able to like, say, Hey, uh, um, you don't just like a lot of people I see will send an email once, right? They'll send it to a firm, say, 
Hi, my name's Kobe. Um, I'd love to onboard with your company. I've got X amount of experience. Here's my resume. Let me know if you could use me. And then you never hear back and you wonder why. These firms have like, you know, 800, 1,000, you know, appraisers or adjusters. They've probably got 500 emails a day in their inbox. They're handling claims and they may or may not even have a need for you right then. Um, to me, it's about communication and follow up, right? And, and perseverance. Act as if, act as if you are starving. No, no matter where you're at, if you want more business, Act as if you were starving. And the only way you're going to get fed is to get that person to say yes. Yeah. Okay? So I send an email. And my emails are typically like, you know, to whom it may concern. Uh, my name's Kobe Hearn. Give a little background about my experience. My resume is attached. Um, I'm currently serving this area. Uh, you know, I would love to see what my company can do for yours. It's changing that mindset of, IA firms owe me something yep. or yep. I want them to pay me. And it's more about how can I serve them? Do you have a need in this area for any of my score? Could you tell me what skills I may need to obtain to earn your business? How can I earn your business? That's a great question to always ask. They may not respond still, but I have it on my calendar to follow up every two weeks like clockwork. And I'll email them again. And if a second email doesn't work, I'm going to Google, because Google's a great tool these days with technology, I will find their number. Whether I find it in the Facebook chat or I find it somewhere else, right. um, I will pick up the phone and call them. I'm a phone guy. I really believe, uh, you know, text messaging in the world of emails, a phone call will go further than anything else. If you can hear their voice, they can hear yours. Be pleasant. Don't be scared of the phone. Call them. Just say, hi, my name's Kobe Hearn. I'm, again, act as if you're starving. What do you have to lose? The worst thing they can say is no. My favorite quote for sales is, every strike brings me closer to another home run. Babe Ruth said that. Meaning, for every no you get, you're getting closer to a yes. You have to be. It's statistically impossible to get no's all the way across the board all the time. Right. And on that, uh, uh, with that being said, IA firms are looking for people all the time. But the point is, you got to stay front of mind. If you sent that one email, four months go by, six months go by, and then a hurricane hits, do you think they remembered you? No, but I promise you, they remember somebody like James Mathis that has burned their phone up and sent them <laughs> tons of emails and said, you know, hey, look at me, I'm the beautiful guy here that wants to do your claims. They'll remember him. They'll remember, oh, my God, we had a hurricane hit Texas. Uh, you know, um, James Mathis, I remember that guy. I talked to that guy. I've talked to him like four times. Let's see if he's available. I, I'm not sure what the back-end conversation is, but I promise you, if you've yeah. ever listened to James Mathis or – talk to them same as matt same He's as me an inappropriate joke it's probably what the back, the back end conversation it, is it, exactly but the the point being is that they remember him right with matt me james whoever they remember him just because he's a personable guy. He chats and he's trying to gain their business but he's always asking what can i do where can i go what, what how can i serve yeah. you yes. the company because at the end of the day, it's not if you're all about just you making money, you're not probably going to be very successful at business. Your business is always serving someone else. That's how business works. So find out what they need so they can make more money, and ex facto, you make more money. So that's, mm -hmm. that's sales in a nutshell. Follow up. Be persistent. Be resilient. You don't have to be a big talker. You know, I've seen people that are super quiet, you know, like don't hardly speak, but they could sell anything. They don't have to say much. They're, they're not like me that take a lot of words to accomplish the same goal. They, they can take very few oh, words. You and me both, man. That's why and, I edit my videos because <laughs> I'm just like, blah, 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 blah. Exactly. You just keep rolling on and on, but these guys can just dial it in and say very few words. And again, just communicate what you want, why you want it, and how you can and how you can fill a need for their company. 
Um, and, and with sales, with with any kind of sales work or what, you, again, you're starving, you need work. Like it, It's that have a sense of urgency, right? Ha, ha, have a sense of urgency that you need those sales. And what I was actually thinking, I was losing my train of thought for a second, but I brought it back to, yes, they may tell you no, but a no does not mean a no for a no. They say no for right now. It's not a no forever. Like I've yeah, contacted yeah. firms and they said, no, we don't really have a need right now. But send they always say that. we'll keep it on file. And you're like, yeah, whatever. Yeah, but but they do. They really do. They do. Like if they you do. follow up and, you know, just again, call firm A and they say, no, Kobe, sorry, we don't really have anything in your area right now. They, I almost always hear that. We'll keep you on file. But they always say right now. A no is not a no forever. It's a no for right now. So don't follow up with them next week. It's not going to change, right? If it does, they probably will call you because the hurricane hit, and there you go. But put them on your list for four or six months later to follow up, right? Just to, hey, guys, I know you didn't have a need then, but I know things can change pretty quickly. Just wanted to follow up. Maybe a follow-up email, maybe a follow-up call, Um Last but not least, just a personal tip of mine, every Christmas I have a list of IA, IA firms that I send a gift basket to. I'm not saying you have to send a gift basket, but how many of you out there listening sent a Christmas card this last year to all the firms that gave you business or sent them something for Christmas to say thank you for your business? It's something I learned in sales. We do it every year for our biggest clients. Um, but how many cards do you think those guys get? And I, and I will say this, every single IA firm I sent something to, the president of their company reached out and thanked me. The president of their company now knows my name, okay? Yeah. May not mean a lot, but I, I, I feel like that's a pretty good thing for a guy that, you know, kind of just really got going um, and hitting stride for these firms to know my name. Um, the QC guys, the, the all the guys in the office, the dispatch people, they all got that basket of food. They all like they were like, yeah, we s- s- scarfed it up in like Thanks three days. Donuts, like, bro. <laughs> yeah. But but it, it doesn't. T- I'm not saying spend a lot, but that's how you stay front of mind. That's how people remember you. It's by small little actions and continual follow up. And this is how you gain business, guys. And if you sit back and say, oh, I got enough business or, you know, I, you know, I, I'm not good at sales, do not get into business. Don't, don't do it. You're going to uh, – you just – it just will not work for you. You may get lucky and get one firm that keeps you busy for 20 years, but the the I'm saying playing the odds, your your percentages are very low for success. Sure, sure. And th- I think this is this discussion here, this this part of the, the conversation. I think it's a prime example of one of those things that adjusters really need to, as, as small business people need to have nailed down, right? Because with within this particular segment, right, you're, you've got your sales man hat on, your sales director hat at your own little, you know, Matt, it's Matt's I, I'm the IA guy, whatever, LLC, right? I have process and performance goals for my sales, right? So I have a whole process about how I'm going to get in front of the, the key people that I need to, right? It's on the phone. You know, when, when I have to, it's the all, IA firms are always having um, meet and greets, especially this summer. They're doing, they're, they're always doing certifi- like uh, carrier certifications or little trainings or seminars and things like that where you go to Atlanta, you go to Dallas or you go to Houston, you go to San Antonio, you go wherever. And you Let me say there. this, Matt. Yeah. I, I just, just on that, just, just on that one point, just right there. A lot of people will go to those trainings and walk out and, oh, my God, I got my certification and leave. No, no. Why would you not stop and try to talk to every person there? And I'm not saying sling a card, but just check. Hey, man, that was great training. Thank you so much. When's your next training? Uh, And they they will be engaged. They'll ask you, who are you? Where are you from? What do you do? Like, what's your experience level? Um, And I promise you, I know for a fact there's people that get deployed just from those conversations. Oh, absolutely. That's that my point is that it's, 
It's a, it's an absolutely priceless networking opportunity. It's like served up on a plate, you know, go to the conferences, go to the conventions. Um, so you always like it's just the James Mathis method. You always got to be in their face one way or the other and always be, you know, and with a smile, like somebody will, he does this all the time. He'll, he'll tell them, he'll say, listen, you know, if you got a flyer, it's two and a half, three and a half, four and a half, six hours, one way out of the way. And you can't get anybody to do it. Give me a call. I'll take care of it with a smile. Not going to bitch about the mileage. Not going to complain about, you know, well, I lost money on that one. No, you didn't. <laughs> Look at the, the, over the course of the whole year, right? If you got deployed because you did that one thing for that, that dispatcher, that dispatcher is going to be looking for a way to pay you back for that. Here's 37 no. commercial claims in, in Minneapolis, Matt. Here's, you know, <laughs> hey, listen, we, we got a, we picked up a new uh, carrier client and we're piloting a new s software program. We're paying, you know, 90% of the fee bill. Um, you know, you want to go run some, do it, it happens all the time, right? It's reciprocity, which I'm sure, you know, as a business person and a salesperson, you, you full knowledge of, it's real. I mean, it's, and it's magic and in, in what it can do. These days, there are a growing number of remote work opportunities for independent adjusters. With Scoper Writer programs popping up all over the place, you can do photo and scope in the field, or you can just sit at home in your pajajays and write the estimates on what the scoper got when they were out in the field. And it doesn't matter where you live, as long as you have the internet, you can write claims as a desk adjuster, but you can't get that sweet gig without being licensed. So if you live in Nebraska, which doesn't require an adjuster to be licensed, you still have to have a New York license to write claims somebody scoped in New York, makes sense? Of all the credentials you need as an adjuster, there really is none more important than your adjuster license, especially your first one. You're gonna need it to do just about everything else, including some adjuster schools even require you to have one before they'll let you enroll. So you need Adjuster Pro. Adjuster Pro provides a comprehensive and easy to use way to get and maintain your adjuster licenses. Most importantly, Adjuster Pro was founded by independent adjusters and the team at Adjuster Pro is dedicated to helping you thrive as an adjuster with resources for every licensing state, including dead simple CE packages. Adjuster Pro is the gold standard for adjuster licensing. You'll find everything you need to get licensed in one place. Go to adjustertv.com slash adjuster pro right now. People, people sell to people, right? Like yes. it's not people job like, all the way around. I have a widget. I have a widget. The widget doesn't sell itself. I have to. I, I my relationship with Matt, verbal and nonverbal, will sell that widget. Not. I know people that will buy far inferior products just because the guy selling it. They like that guy. Yeah. But, oh yeah. But but on on the second part of the sales, just to you know quickly because I don't want to stay on this topic forever because I can talk about sales. The second part of sales is customer retention. Yes. Don't cut your nose off to spite your face because, oh, I've been working for this firm a while. They sent me a dog crap claim that's not paying anything. And then you end up, you know, killing that business. Be cognizant. Yeah. Like, look, there, you have to know when to thrive. Chris Stanley said it best, you know, you know, say no to survive. Yes, to thrive at a certain point in your career. I love that. But in the same sense, I see a lot of people be like, oh, I won't work for 65 percent fee bill. It has to be 70% or above, you know, um, yeah. and maybe you're there in your career and that's fine, but I'm going to tell you that's horrible advice. Um, you know, like, like Matt was saying, James Mathis with a smile on his face, even with experience and as many connections as he has, he still does it with a smile on his face. Don't cut off a firm because, you know, I've had people call me saying, I'm really tired of firm A. Their QC keeps kicking all my files back for no reason. They're not in the guidelines. I'm like, well, have you picked up the phone and talked to them? Yeah, yeah I talked to, to them one time maybe. Um, and I'm like, you need to really like dig into that, A. And I said, B, you want to cut them off? And they're like, yeah, I, I'm done. I, I, I can't do this. I can't work for this firm anymore. I said, how many claims a week are they giving you? Oh, they're probably giving me 10 to 15. I said, okay. Who's the next closest for your dailies? Uh, firm B with three or four. I said, you're going to be bankrupt. You can't make up 15 claims just like that. There's not firms out there. There's certain firms that just have more volume. That's just yeah. a fact. And But they're going to cut their nose off to spite their face because either they had a bad experience or 
the firm is maybe tough to work with. Now, I'm not saying set goals on the back end to say, hey, I'm going to work for firm A until I can get firm B, C, D, E, and F to make up for that, right? That, that's when you really start thriving, but that also goes into diversifying, being sustainable, um, you know, building your toolkit of all the different things you can do um, as far as plane types and, and skill sets. Um, but I just wanted to say that because I see too many people too quick to cut, you know, cut somebody off or to say no to a small firm. And I, I have seen this firsthand where a firm is giving you the most work and a small firm calls and you're like, no, nah, I'm not going to help you out on this or no, nah, that's too far. And then that firm, that small firm takes all that business from that big firm all of a sudden. It happens in this industry. Oh, it does. All constantly. Carriers are jump. Carriers will bankrupt. IA firms, and you won't even know it. But basically, you know, firm the small firm um, may have taken all that business that you said, no, I won't help you with, right? I, I don't, I, nah, it's too far. I've got all this business. I, I don't need you. And then that big business collapses, and that big carrier jumps from that firm to the other firm, and you're, hold, you're left holding the bag. Because if you think that firm didn't remember you, if you think firms don't remember when you get, you know, snippy or call their QC guy or their claims guy, and last but not least on, on the whole subject of cutting your nose off to spite your face, guys, you never know who you're talking to. I believe firmly in you treat the CEO the same way you treat the janitor, with the same level of respect for the same level of integrity and the same way it doesn't matter what their position is in the company because i can promise you if you do this long enough that qc guy that customer you know that csr rep or whoever it is or that claims manager may be running the company one day or they may decide your fate in this whole industry and you don't even know it so that that's my that's my soapbox <laughs> on customer retention and 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 not cutting your nose off to spite your face for sure yeah i it's and everything you said i think is absolutely spot on especially with regard to you know the industry there's so many it's not a very big industry first of all it's just not that big there just aren't that many companies <clears throat> but the people that are in the industry most of the people that you that are your managers like your direct manager was probably an adjuster most likely there's occasions where they're they were transferred in from you know SIU or from you know underwriting or something like that or they were a contractor and now they're your manager or something they skip the the whole I'm a it's not very common usually they're an adjuster and when they get into the team lead then the next thing they've got you know they're they're following their goals right their performance and process goals and they're it's absolutely 100% true that you'll see people you know especially as many years as I have into it who were guys that I was in sitting in orientation with sitting next to me, you know, like saying, Hey, you want to get a beer after this who are running firms now? Right. And they're the owner of the firm and they're, you know, so you, you, you treat everybody, like you said, absolutely with dignity and respect at all times. I, I don't care who it is, you know, the contractor, the customer, you know, the, the, when you're wearing a red shirt with a company logo on it, or even if you're not person at the grocery store, right. Mm -hmm. Because if, if you're a jerk to the checkout person or the bag boy, people are going to see that, you know, and, you're, and especially if you're in a small town and this is talk about soapboxes, <laughs> I mean, you know, you, you, you might be one of three adjusters working in a little small town. Everybody knows everybody. And that might be, that might be the agent's aunt. And she's like, that guy came in wearing a state farm shirt and he was very rude to me. Oh, well, what did he look like? Oh, he was. And next thing you know, you're getting a call from your manager. Hey, listen, we got a call, you know. You don't want that at all. And it's not, honestly, that's not the main reason like why you should be nice to everybody for me. But that's kind of, I think for a lot of people, it's kind of the most, one of the most tangible things. But it's just, when you, when you I, I have a thing, my little theory, um, or I guess it's an observation really, I call it the circle of happiness. And it's basically when you, when you, you kind of like, you're doing your job, right? You, and you're going to say yes when you need to say yes and say no when you say no. But you you do it in a friendly way and treating people with dignity and respect at all times, answering their questions. If they're rude to you, you're not rude back. 
that kind of thing, if, if you, that's your habit, if that's your process, right, then that cultivates goodwill because that starts to, you know, even if you, you look at 100 houses and you talk to 100 people and three of them call their agent or call your manager's manager's manager and say, hey, your adjuster came out, you know, they, they, uh, they really took, took care of us and we felt like that, you know, we were heard and that we got a fair shake on our claim and all this kind of stuff that starts to build on itself. And so you, you, you make the company look good, you make the, your IA firm look good to the carrier, you know, you make the, comp, the carrier look good to the, to the customer, you make the agent look, I mean, everybody looks good, right? So it's, it, it becomes kind of like this, like an upward spiral that I believe that as, as far as your customer service component when, when you're running claims. And, and, and really, honestly, to get you on that first call list, you know, you got that goal, I wanna hit $130,000, if you get that reputation that you're taking care of customers and you're, everything else looks good, you're on the first call list and you're going to get more claims. They're gonna to try to figure out, figure out a way to keep you busy because they don't wanna lose people that have that kind of ethos in the field that they're treating everybody that way. And they're, you know, they're just, it's, a, it's part of being a well-rounded adjuster. Well, well, people just gravitate to, to likable people, right? And I'm not saying yeah. you have to have the most outgoing personality, no, no. but it, it, it doesn't cost you anything to smile. It doesn't cost you anything to pay a kind word to somebody. Um, and it, it just seems like, you know, in a world that we live in now, there's, there's a lot of hate and tensions and things like that. But just, you know, it's funny, you know, what is it? Jackie Moon from uh, Tropic Thunder or whatever that movie was. He says, everybody love everybody. <laughs> well, I, I'm not saying you have to be outgoing and bubbly. Don't fake it. People know that you're fake. But it, you should treat, you know, again, personally, don't bring your work home with you to the kids and to the wife. And don't bring your personal into work. It, you're doing a job. And, and the people that you're interacting with, and I think Matt said it best, this shouldn't be the only place you're doing it or why you're doing it. The big why is just humanity in general and being a good human being. But more so if we're talking about just business, you know, like you said, you know, you may have great customer service and, and that's great, but I promise you, you'll get on the first call list if they just like you, if they like talking to you, if, if you seem easy to talk to, you're a nice, likable guy. That, that's uh, you don't have to be talkative you don't have to be necessarily like huge you know bubbly and you know those people that are just giddy all the time mm -hmm. but just somebody that they like being around or interacting you you see it you, you meet people that don't even talk that people just seem to gravitate towards because they command a room with their knowledge with their presence with how they carry themselves um, and and just with the fact that they're inviting. They have an inviting posture. They have an inviting demeanor. And these are things that you need to, I always talk about this all the time with business, but self-evaluation. Always be willing to be hard on yourself, be critical of yourself, give yourself feedback, and ask others for feedback. Um, but, you know, I've, I've heard of it. I've seen it in other industries. I've seen it even in this industry where one phone call can change the entire course of your life. Of your of your professional life because you couldn't keep it together you couldn't keep things separated you just lost it or you decided to just you know drop some you know curse words and say some things that you you know you may have meant e even after the moment's gone but was it worth it and and why what what does it help it's kind of like i have a pet peeve just to wrap this up on my end I have a pet peeve. Do not call a customer service representative and yell at them like it, it's like say it's Dish or DirecTV or something. You call them and ream them out for thirty minutes. Why? They had nothing to do with your service being down. They had nothing to do with why your stuff is not working. They don't deserve it. They don't get paid enough. If you want to call the CEO of the company, okay, good luck getting a hold of them. Maybe they deserve it, or, or the board needs to hear it, but they're not going to. So why? create a crappy day for someone else that's already probably dealing with that. It's a pet peeve of mine. Why blame, you know, the the waiter or the waitress for a slow cook staff or because they don't have enough staff, you know? Um, if they're being – it's just I guess those are pet peeves of mine to blame somebody that had nothing to do with it. 
you know, even at these firms. Why call the CSR person and blame them or the QC person that's just following guidelines when it has to do with the carrier? And I, I, I promise you, you're not calling Big Red or Big Blue or any of those and going to lose it on them. You lose that, that might as well just be like, well, here's your pink slip. Good luck, you know, digging ditches or whatever else you're going to do. <laughs> well, you know, and I think I, I think if, uh, you know, having done claims for forever and, I, you know, you've done claims, if you're on the other end of that call, think about how that makes you react, right? If, if I get on the phone with somebody... And the very first thing, and this happens on hurricanes a lot, um, because hurricanes are usually, they've already gone sideways by the time you show up and start making phone calls. Um, you start, you you start making your calls and people start screaming in your ear. Um, but you know, if early on in my career, my initial reaction was to take that personally. Um, these days I'm like, okay, I'm just going to let that person just like vent, let it all out. You know, get every get every hit every bullet point that they got in their brain that they think they got to chew somebody's butt about, right? And then when they, you hear them, they're done and they're just breathing heavy because they just exerted themselves. You know, I'm taking notes and I'm like, okay, well, let's talk about this. Let me let's see, see if we can figure out how to you know alleviate your, your concerns, right? And you, and it usually comes down to poor communication from somebody, uh, not doing what they not people not doing what they said they were going to do, right? I'm going to be there at nine o'clock on Monday. You know, Monday goes by and they don't, he they can't get the guy on the phone. And then, you know, he calls on at five o'clock on Tuesday. Hey, I just wanted to see if it was okay if I came over. Well, I thought you were going to be here yesterday morning at nine, getting your butt chewed, right? The, the, what happens on hurricanes, just as kind of an aside, and then we'll kind of move on to the next point. But if, when the hurricane hits, they will, and this has been, I think as long as there's been like a hurricane wind ins- wind claims insurance, it's been a thing is that the carriers will throw every p- possible person at the problem because they are at, at the claim. So they will assign claims to anybody that shows up at all, period. People will not know what they're doing, you know, whether willfully or they just, you know, they're brand new to this. They heard about it and they just, just they wanted to throw themselves onto the fire. <laughs> And they will drop the ball, right? So they'll <laughs> like because I, Hurricane Katrina was a good example for me. I, I was working. I, I was working. I think I was working in Wisconsin. Anyway, um, I got a call. I knew the hurricane was hitting and everything, but I was on a storm, right? Already, so I wasn't going to be like bail on my storm to go on this big hurricane. Um, you got to finish the, the the job that you're on, you know, because you're helping them no matter what. Because a claim is a claim, right? And just because a hurricane hits doesn't mean you're going to get like total losses and get, make a bunch of money. You, I mean, you have a potential to, but anyway, so two weeks after the storm hit and they were assigning claims, um, they wrapped up my, the gig I was on and sent me to Louisiana or to uh, mobile. Right. So I get down there and they handed me 70 claims, start making phone calls and people were like, they started chewing my ear off because I was like, hey, this is Matt from your insurance company. I just want to, Matt, well, what happened to John? I'm like, uh, well, who's, who's John? Well, he's, he's uh, the last guy that called. And, and uh, you know, before that, we had you know, Tom, and he came out and uh, said he was going to call us, and he never did. And then, then this John guy called, and he never showed up. And now you're calling. So what the hell's going on? You know, so they, no, it's not unreasonable <laughs> to be upset in that situation, right? So... With claims, you're going to find people that are that are like, you know, it's and I say this all the time. It's like people you're you're, finding, you're catching them at every possible point in the spectrum of like the human experience in America, right? So, people who are top of the socioeconomic to the bottom, everything in between, and every possible condition in between, right? So you can go to a guy's house who's you know it's a 1.5 million dollar house, and he just lost his job, and he had a death in the family. He just found out he had terminal cancer. Doesn't matter, right? Or he's, he, he had a, uh, fell down the stairs at work or something like that and messed up his back and he's in severe pain, chronic pain. He can't barely move, right? This guy's not going to be, probably going to be nice to you. He's going to be like, let's get this over with because I'm in excruciating pain just standing here shaking your hand, right? So I learned that I have to, let that stuff just wash over me and just say, all right, I'm, I can't take any of this personally. My ego has got to stay at home and take care of that guy. And again, it all comes back to 
to everybody kind of, even though the, you're, you're getting like a, f a full slice of humanity as an adjuster, they all, everybody, no matter what, no matter where they are, they're all going to have the same half dozen basic questions right for you. So it's, it's going to be, you know, when do I get paid for this? Do, what do I have to pay out of pocket? What if a contractor says it's going to be more? What if they find more damage, right? It's, there's, there's, those are the questions that you're going to get. And if you of can, course. you know, when, 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 when's this going to happen? When's that going to happen? You know, what do I have to do? Those, those are the, the essential things. And if you take that guy who's screaming in your ear, let him air it out and, and run out of steam and then start hitting him with, okay, well, here's, the, here's how the process works. Step one, we're going to do this. Step two, we're going to do this. Step, step three. And all you have to do is A. That's all you got to do. I'll do B, C, D, E through X, right? You take care of A and we're good to go. Oh, okay. That sounds easy. All right. Okay, cool. Well, listen, you know, I was, I was a little grumpy earlier and I apologize. I mean, that happens all the time. Or, you know, oh, yeah. they'll call back the next day. Listen, you know, I, I was thinking about that. And I talked to my wife and she, she punched me in the arm really hard because I, I, was, I was kind of a jerk to you. And I'm, I just want to call back and say, I'm sorry, man. I, you know, it's been a rough day. Da, da, da. Constantly it happens. Like, so you have, to, you have to let that kind of wash over you. And, I, and again, I'm, I soapbox on this because this is like, this is so, it's almost <laughs> core to like the customer service providing a good customer service experience. But let's talk about pro profits instead. Oh, yeah. Customer service. So <laughs> as an adjuster, how, how can we kind of take, um, take our, our sort of like dreams of like, you know, hitting six figures or making, making more than we're making now, maybe if that's $60,000 a year, $80,000 a year, how do we make that a reality in a realistic way with, with how we run claims. Are you interested in more than just punching a clock and paying the bills? Wouldn't you rather be on the A-team surrounded by the best of the best in the industry? Then you need to check out Eberl Claim Service. For well over 30 years, Eberl's philosophy of treating adjusters as they wish to be treated has allowed them to establish a vast network of the most professional, educated, and dedicated adjusters in the industry. So at Eberl, you're in good company. If you're a motivated and compassionate adjuster slash claims professional, Eberl wants you to represent their organization. Go to jobs.eberls.com right now and get started with Eberl Claim Service. My slogan. Again, somebody else may have this, but I came up with it in my head. I didn't read it anywhere, but I, I believe my, my catchphrase is putting profits back into your processes, right? Um, and I, I really, uh, what that means is, is that for everything that you do has an efficiency level. You know, how efficient are you at getting it done? How, how well do you get these things done? Um, and I find a lot of people... Um, do not have consistency within their business. You know, it's always that their hair is on fire, right? They're going a million miles an hour and I'm making money, I'm making money and I'm spending money and I'm doing this, and I'm doing that. And I'm just a million different directions. And they do not have processes set up from, like I said, single tasking. And you've talked about it, I think at length, um, you know, of when do you do your accounting? When do you do your scheduling? When do you do your claims? How quickly should you be getting them done? All these things, how many do you do in a day? But setting up those processes so you can make money, and I said it kind of at the first of this show, you know, identify what you do well, right? Like, hey, I do auto really well. I can scope, I can write them, I can, um, you know, handle the claim process. That's what I do well. That's what most adjusters and appraisers do well, right? Yeah. But what I don't do well, and I'm a business guy, I don't do accounting. I'm not a bean counter. I don't like sitting there doing it. Um, there's parts of it I do as far as tracking with QuickBooks, but it's very quick. It's very calculated. It's done at the end of every week. That's basically how I close my week out. But I outsourced it to an accountant that I pay to handle my business taxes, to make sure I'm set up correctly, to make sure I'm categorizing all of my expenses correctly, that I'm getting maximum deductions. Now, this goes for, let, let me let me put this caveat in there. This goes for if you're a W-2 adjuster or you're a 1099, okay? This goes for any facet of your life. You've got to know what is your net profit, okay? The, the, 
the the saying that I got from Brad Fancher, teacher at IA Path, and uh, I would call him a veteran appraiser now, is don't work for wages. And the only way you can know that, right? Like we got into this industry to have more freedom or more money or more time or all of that. If you really want to boil it down, let's take some easy math numbers, okay? Let's say you make $1,000 in a day. That sounds awesome to a lot of people, I'm sure. $1,000. Business dictates that 30% of that is going to Uncle Sam. That's just a fact. That's just how it works. So guess what? Take 300 out of that right quick. Uncle Sam gets that. You're at 700. Now, if you have gross inefficiencies, like... Oh, you eat out? Oh, you, you stopped at McDonald's for breakfast? You stopped for lunch at McDonald's? You, you went out to dinner, you know, and decided to, you know, buy a big, you know, ribeye steak? Let's say you do that. Let's say you, you eat every meal out. You don't pack a lunch. Um, and let's say gas-wise, you, you grossly are inefficient in your routing. And you're going three, three hours this way and then three hours back that way, and you got to come back. Like, yeah. you didn't route it or schedule correctly. You can be spending upwards of two or three hundred dollars in that day, plus, and and that's in variable expenses. Let's say variable expenses on that low end, hundred bucks, right? That that means your gas, your your food, um, things like that, right? So you're down to six hundred. But see, a lot of people miss this part: the fixed expenses. If you take your software, which mine for CCC one is around two hundred dollars, okay. So I break that down per working day. I work, let's say, 20 days in a month, do the math, find what that is, and then add in the cost of my E&O insurance, uh, liability or, or general you know, workman or comp or whatever you want to say insurance-wise. I boil that down per day. I boil down my fixed business costs um, you know, of whatever it may be, these different, again, my accounting. I have to pay for my accounting. I boil those down per day, and I think my numbers, again, I'd have to check because I have it all in a spreadsheet, and I don't, I usually remember all my numbers. But I'd say per day, um, for total business expenses fixed, I'm at around $125. Okay. Mm -hmm. So add in my $125 plus my $100, I'm at $225 if you've been following along minus the 700 or take 700 minus that you're down to what we're down to 475 bucks okay so that is your net profit but then what if you worked 16 hours that day i don't i don't know matt, matt says he's not good at math i'm not either but i'm going to pull out my calculator <laughs> that my math teacher said that i never have a you know calculator in my pocket right. yeah which is laughing now um but <laughs> what, we, what do we say 475 divided by 16 i don't know if you can see that 29 dollars and 68 cents an hour yeah that's not bad it's not horrible. Some people would love that. But if you haven't been looking around lately, McDonald's is paying like $15, $20 an hour plus a signing bonus, and all you're doing is flipping oh burgers gosh. and not dealing with mad claimants and insureds. And that's I, I should even say factoring in wear and tear on your truck, on your tools, on your equipment that you may be depreciating. So, again, and, and the simple part of it is don't work for wages, make sure you can back it up and have an accountant show you. They, they can easily show you. QuickBooks can be set up to show you what your net profit is, you know, after earnings, depreci earnings, you know, depreciation, interest, tax, and assets, whatever. Yeah, EBITDA. Um, but you want to learn these things enough to know, is it worth it? Because think if I to cut that number down to $500 a day, right? For some of you auto appraisers out there, that's what you may make on a cat per day. But if you're buying, a, if you've got hotel and, and gas and food and these overhead software and tools and expenses and wear and tear on your car, what are you really making? Yeah, Making $10 an hour, $15 an hour? You can go work at Amazon for that. That's where your efficiencies, I pack my lunch. OK, it's yeah. just what I do. My scheduling is always on the most efficient route I can possibly be on for gas, for my car and for time. Because if I write, if I route perfectly, 
I can get in in these summer days if I needed to. I can knock out 15 to 20 claims a day in auto. Yeah. And then you do the math. If any of you know what, you know, auto typically pays or makes that, you know, but I can bring in a large sum of money with the same fixed costs that I have every day and very little to no variable expense. Because, again, some of you may argue, well, gas, the more gas you run, you know, the more money you should make. Yes, you're right, as long as you schedule it correctly. If you don't, like I said, be efficient in everything you do. As a business owner, you should always try to be more efficient. Like, I'm super quick. Anybody that you'll talk to, in my, I can write an estimate probably as quick as anybody for auto. However... I'm still trying to get it down. I'm still trying to find tricks and small little buttons and tools. And with every update, I'm checking to see if there's anything new or staying up with just, you know, trends because I want to get quicker. I want to scope vehicles quicker. If there's a, if there's something I can do just a little bit quicker of, oh, I need to snap this photo and that photo at the same time. So I'm already here, but I am always looking at my efficiencies. Time is money. Um, Money is money. Yep. You know, and you may think you're making an infinite an infinity amount of money. And like Matt mentioned about, you know, you may work for six or eight months on, on hurricanes and that's great. But then you didn't budget for the other four months. So understanding that, understanding what your ebb and flow looks like. And if you're new and you don't really know, I, I say this, I, I will I will say this right now. Live as if. You can only afford what your expenses are, right? I don't care. You make $20,000 and your expenses are two, $18,000 should go into your bank account, into a savings bank account that you will hold until you at least get a year or two under your belt to know what your total costs and what that kind of ebb and flow of work will be, um, again, so that you're always covered. I mean... Uh, most people with taxes want the government to take out more money than they should for the simple fact they don't want, you know, they like getting that money back at the end of the year, at least putting it in savings or an investment. You may make some money off of it, but at the end of the day, don't come up short as a business owner, right? So make everything efficient. Um, that's the best example I can give you, but just don't work for wages, guys. That that sucks. To work 16, 18 hours a day and deal what we deal with day in and day out. And you're like, well, when I boil it down, I made $15 an hour on average. And then you've got a guy flipping burgers for eight hours and, and just kicking your butt right now. Like, yep, yep. that's not good. <laughs> Would you like and to I'm not saying you, with that, sir? <laughs> but I'm not saying property or auto that you're making that. I'm just saying if you're grossly inefficient, if you're not maximizing and again, I go back to the word, word paranoid. I, I, you know, I used to sleep in. I used to love my sleep. I was a night owl. I wake up every morning at 5.30 or 6 a.m. at the latest. Why? Not because I have to, not because I'm running out the door for claims. It's because of my efficiencies of getting my coffee, getting breakfast, um, and then looking over supplements and what I do to be the most efficient in my day. And I will tell you this just as a parting kind of thought. I mean, we may have more, but this is my one big thought. Look at any Fortune 500 CEO. I can promise you they wake up no later than 6 o'clock. Oh, guaranteed. Absolutely. And I, I, I bet they get no more than six hours of sleep a night, if that. But they're always paranoid, and they're always when, – when there's work to be done and when people are up to work, they're working. Even if they may not, even if you don't think you have anything to do in business, there's, there's always, always something, something you can do. do. Always something so to do. That, that's one thought I want to make sure I stick in, in, in your minds out there that's yeah. listening. Yeah. It's, it's, listen, it's a whole, I got, the reason I got started with doing the adjuster TV thing is because I wrote a whole book about, I just poured my brain out into this book about being efficient. Single tasking, single tasking for people who don't know is the exact opposite of multitasking. You take one thing that you're doing, shut off all, all distractions, and you do that thing until it's done. Or you do it until you can't do anything else on it, right? Incremental efficiencies, you have to take every single one of your, as you get experience as an adjuster, you start to see all, you know, start to see that matrix, 
and you see, all right, well, I can, I can shave off two minutes on importing and labeling photos. I can shave six minutes off of my, how I walk around a building, right? Doing it, this is a more efficient way than going over there and coming back and going over there and coming back, right? And so all those things start to add up together to, it's not that you're, I always say this, you're not that you're, you're going faster, it's that you're just taking less time to do all the tasks that are involved in closing that claim or whatever you're, you're working on. So yeah, man, it's, and it, it's, it's the thing that makes it worth it for me. It's like, I, it, it wouldn't be worth it otherwise because it's, it can be hard work. It's, it can be tedious, and repetitive, and you can get, you know, get yelled at a bunch of people are have bad attitudes can kind of wear you down being hot outside. You know, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's not, you're not breaking rocks in the sun necessarily, but you're, you know, it's a, it's a demanding job and it takes a, a it's, it's a, f a 16 hour day. Even if you're just sitting in a cubicle typing away, that's still a long day, right? And you still feel like you're beat at the end of that day. Um, so you have to make it, you got to make it worth it. But, uh, I think the, the real question that everybody has is what's with the hat, man? <laughs> well, um, I, the best way I can explain this is, uh, I was in Colorado starting out my claims career. Um, and as I was, um, Greeley hat works, shameless plug for those guys. If anybody ever wants to look up a, they're, they've been in business for like over 70, maybe even a hundred years. They make custom hats. They were one of my clients. Um, and I just happened to go in there and I said, you know what, you guys give us business. I, I want a hat. I, I, I really want you know, but I've got that. I didn't want like a regular cowboy hat. I'm not a cowboy. I, you know, I've been in Wyoming and I, I know what true cowboys look like on ranches. And that's not me. I, I, I've done farm work. I'm a farm boy. But I said, you know, I just want that touch of, you know, kind of professional hat look mixed in with that cowboy and kind of, you know, give it a homage or throwback to the 20s and 30s. And they, he, he kind of put this together for me and I started wearing it out on claims just at, you know, in the area I was at, you know, to have some shade from the sun. It was hot. I mean, you know, you're in Colorado, high elevations and it just stuck as my, you know, adjuster's hat or my, you know, my appraisal hat. So this is what I wear. Um, you know, I wear my typical garb. I think everybody wears with, uh, you know, shirt and khakis or slacks or whatever, but it just kind of stuck as my thing. Yeah. And this happened, you know, only, you know, a couple years ago. So. No, it's a cool hat, man. I dig it. It's been, it's kind of your signature. I, and I, I knew you were going to be wearing it. You, I've never seen you not wearing the hat. So nobody, nobody really has. Although I, I do want to do this just so I show you, I do you have, have good hair. You've got good. I hair. have great hair. I have more hair than I need, but. Boy, I just, I just I so people don't think I'm wearing it because I'm bald. <laughs> just, you yeah. know. Well, I should probably start wearing a hat because I'm starting to, it's starting to, you know. Anyway, so <laughs> this has been a cool conversation, man. So if people want to learn more about what you've got going on, uh, where can they go? Where can they find you? Um, yeah, so there's a few places you can find me. IAPATH, um, obviously Chris Stanley's the captain, El Capitan. Um, but I actually teach, uh, I just released a new course with uh, recreational vehicles. Um, so I teach everybody how to write RVs, um, fifth wheels, campers, you know, pop-up campers. I've got that there as a class. I've got uh, CCC1 certification um, training. So the gold standard of software and auto damage. Um, I actually developed that with Chris Stanley and I teach that as a two night course as well. Um, so if you're looking to get into auto, that's where I would start. Same way as Xactimate. We found that there just wasn't much training out there um, for people to learn the software of auto um, and the preferred. So I I teach that as well. And then if you want to find me, put me up on LinkedIn, Kobe Hearn, pretty easy to find with K-O-B-Y, uh, Hearn, H-E-A-R-N. Please reach out, feel free. Um, and uh, also with IAPATH, I do some podcasts, uh, kind of takeovers and talk business. Um, so feel free to reach reach out to me, you know, through those channels as well. But um, got a lot of exciting things happening with IAPATH and then as a SCA franchise owner in business. I'm always got my hands in things, but please feel free to reach out. Uh, Matt can even put my contact info, um, you know, in this or whatnot and, and be 
happy to talk to anybody and answer any questions. I'd say I'm the young mentor out of the group of Matt and James and Chris and everybody else uh, that, that kind of tries to help people getting along. Um, I, I'm kind of the young guy that, uh, you know, has got some experience that is always happy to help, just like every one of these guys. And, it, and mm-hmm. let me say, Matt, pleasure being on your show, man. I watch every episode. You're, you're probably, I would say, a good 50% of the reason I got into this industry, listening to your awesome. adjuster stuff. And, and you, were, you were the first person I ever spoke to about getting into it besides our, our friend. Uh, I reached out to an email. Matt answered immediately, and off my brain went into the claims world. So <laughs> There you go. That's how it goes. Yeah, and I, I think anybody that emails me finds that I, I usually respond pretty quick, although not today. I've kind of been off the – anyway. <laughs> so, well, man, it's been really great having you on, and uh, I'm excited for this to come out and for people to kind of sink their teeth into your insights and this, you know – how to really be successful as a claims professional. I, I, I don't use, you know, I don't say, you know, independent adjuster or claims adjuster anymore because I think that there's so many opportunities in this field that, you know, it's, there's so much room for growth and it really always has been, but these days it feels like there's even more. But so I really appreciate the conversation and uh, hope we can do it again soon, man. Yeah, I'd love to. It's been been a pleasure and and, uh, always happy to come back on. If you enjoyed this episode of Adjuster TV Radio, leave us a five-star review on iTunes. Find more episodes at adjustertv.com slash podcast. This is Adjuster TV.